Hey everybody, this is Ben Atkinson at LinkedIn and this is our interview series, Inspiring Leadership. And this week we're going to be talking about developing leaders and we've got our host here with us, Jonathan Bowman Perks. Um, who are we interviewing this week, Jonathan? Thanks, Ben, and welcome to my favorite time of the week. And um, it's, it's a good old friend I have, James Cameron. Uh, James, who's had a, a very successful 26 years in the military. Um, he commanded his regiment, Prince of Wales's uh, Royal Regiment, uh, as battalion commander, uh, and also had a fascinating role as assistant director of counterterrorism in the British Ministry of Defence, where for the work he did there, which we cannot talk about unless we have to kill you all afterwards, he got the CBE. Um, but James was a universally popular member of our staff college intake, and you'll tell from his humility, but yet his frankness and his honesty of what he had. He also, um, after the 26 years in the military, had uh, six years in consultancy and control risk, where we've had a couple of people from control risk on this series as well. Um, and then from there, got this cracking job as vice president of Walmart stores. James, welcome. It's great to have you on the series. Tell us a bit about your role at Walmart and particularly the response to COVID-19. Um, thank you. Um, it's uh, it's a privilege to be asked to join this. I've watched a few of your previous previous um, sessions. Um, a lot of people I really admire. So I feel slightly, um, uh, you know, I have imposter's mentality going on right now. I shouldn't be on this. But um, uh, so my job in Walmart is, uh, is, is called Vice President of Leadership Initiatives, which is a fairly broad um, description, uh, which I like. I work in the US part of the business, so it's the, the, the largest market, 1.3 um, million employees, uh, probably between 250, 300 billion dollar business. Um, and um, we, uh, my job is entails helping the business think about what's what's coming next and the kind of leadership behaviors and skills we need for that um, as a vehicle for getting people to go in that direction. Um, Johnny, you and I met at Staff College. I've, I've over the last 10 years been creating a sort of similar system, a system for high potential to move through the company. And at the same time as you accelerate people, the really good people into important jobs, you're also imparting to them like key ways of thinking about the future so that they're prepared. Um, so that's one thing I do. I also, at moments like this, we will start large sort of projects or programs to help the company deal with what's going on around us. Uh, as you say, COVID-19 is a big one, as was Black Lives Matter and the, the civil disturbances. We had a lot of stores destroyed, a lot closed. Um, and um, the, the, the sort of things I do, the initiatives I launch are designed to help us move for, through those, acquire all the learning we must, and then move into the future. So it's a, it's a very, very fun job. Mm, I say. And, and how has COVID-19 affected you and your family and friends? I mean, you're in Bentonville in the USA, uh, the home of, of Walmart. And um, you know, how has it affected you Personally, people you know, people around America, because as we, we, we've made a, a complete dog's ear of how we responded to COVID-19 here, uh, and it's also been very challenging in many of the states in America. What, what's been your reading of how things have been for, for someone who's actually been there? Um, well, personally, this is where I work. So I am very used to being filmed on Zoom or communicating through Zoom and or LinkedIn. And um, so we're very lucky as a family. We um, uh, we, we live somewhere nice. We're not in a crowded big city. Uh, for the company, um, no one is working in offices. For those that have that kind of job, we're all working remote, which uh, for the, the kind of thing I've been talking about has given, I've had to learn a lot of new skills and my team has completely pivoted to all virtual. Um, the, the, the ones that we should feel for are the, the, we call them associates, our associates who work in stores, including my son, because the front line has become, all of a sudden the front line has become dangerous. It's not, in, in retail, that's not a normal uh, sort of condition. You expect the occasional sort of um, risks in stores, not everyone at risk all the time, including putting their families at risk when they go mm -hmm. home. So that's mm -hmm. a very, very different. So one of the things I've been doing is um, because of my background in 
crises like um, I was in that job you mentioned in London, the counterterrorism job uh, on the 5th of July, uh, 7th of July 2005, when um, Mohammed Sadiq Khan and three others um, carried out suicide attacks across London. So uh, having the lessons I saw in that kind of crisis and, um, and long periods in Northern Ireland or the Balkans or elsewhere, how you get people to manage risk and commit to managing risk is being incredibly helpful in Walmart over the last four months. So it feels like everything in my life has come to this moment. Um, yeah. Which I'm feeling to have. And that's very interesting, James. It wasn't a question I was intending to ask you, but it's, it's triggered from what you said. You, you've heard others talk about their sort of two or three lessons about handling a crisis and people in, in all the, we've actually had a record number of people sign up to listen to this great tribute to you. Um, and, and it's going to go on to YouTube. It's going to be on LinkedIn again after this. This is live. And then the podcast, which will come on in a few weeks time, will go live to 50 countries. So there's uh, people in, in a whole range of places listening. Um, what would be your tips about handling crisis? Two or three top tips. You know, you've been in many different crises around the world. What, yeah. what, what, what have you learned that you'd say these, these are just foundational tips? Uh, this one is different, but um, uh, the first thing is I've heard a lot of people say this isn't uh, a sprint, it's a marathon. Uh, it's not a marathon, it's a triathlon at the very mm -hmm. least. It has phases, and um, the first phase of any crisis is like the swim. You're underwater, you're confused, you're trying to move forward. You don't really, you're, you're you know, you, you may have done a triathlon. That first phase, getting into the water, everyone swims over you, you're fighting for air. It's very, very confusing. And um, then you you come out of that phase into the, the, the bike. Things get more mechanical. You're able to move forward. You can look ahead. You can look around. And that's where we were for a period. In control risk, we used to tell companies that who would say, how do I know if I'm in, in a crisis? You know you're in a crisis when your normal ways of working aren't working anymore. If you had a Monday meeting with your team, and you find that's not enough, you're going to daily or, or hourly meetings sometimes, that's what happens in a crisis and you have to come up with new ways of working in order to manage it. And uh, that's when, when those are in place, that's when you're in the bike phase. So it's more mechanical, you can get at speed and you get more comfortable. But then where we are now is the last phase when we don't know how long it's gonna be, we're in the sort of the long exhausting run. Transitions are hard when you get off that bike, and try and run it's incredibly difficult your muscles are all tied up so the transitions are hard and when you get into the run and you don't know how far it's going to be that's where we are right now people are tired um so that metaphor i found is very very yeah. helpful and thinking about your leadership requirements in each phase and some people are really good in the swim some people are really good on the bike some people are better when they're totally exhausted they have that resilience how are you dealing with those things is something I'm really helping a lot of leaders think through. Um, and um, the, the other bit of advice I would give about a crisis is that early, um, early on, we tend to get very directive, like do this, um, you know, and that's what is expected of leaders. And you will have all seen there's a, you know, the situational leadership or, the, uh, the, the the spectrum from directive to empowering. Um, if you don't get to empowering people very, very fast, you slow right down and you exhaust yourself. So empowerment isn't just a nice thing to do for teams. It's a, it's, it, it'll, it, it's, it will help you endure because otherwise everyone's coming to you for uh, asking for what they should be doing next as opposed to then getting on with it themselves with all the innovations and the and the you know everyone feels much more motivated when they have some control yeah so those are the things i'm finding are the most helpful lessons um in in the uh, in this crisis i'll just come to you ben in a second just to, to to follow on for a moment it is interesting you pick the the triathlon analogy which clearly mm -hmm. you've done because you know what it's like and every year from when i was 55 or 52 i think you know it was 52 I was doing a triathlon every year. The first one was the Virgin Excel, which was a huge one in London. And I do remember people sort of swimming over me and it being yeah. filthy water. And then and then I, I pushed myself so hard. I was going so fast and I came out. I thought, this is great. I'm at the front of the pack. 
And on the bike phase, I was just being overtaken by everybody, it seemed. Yeah. And, and then on the run, I got back into it. But it's just, it's a very good analogy. Yeah, it's not a sprint, it's a triathlon. Yeah. really like that one. I, I will yeah. definitely um, allocate that thought to you because I'm going to use that. It's a great concept. Ben, you had a thought, Ken. I was just sort of thinking you, you, your, your thoughts about um, during a crisis where you've got to sort of create that sort of purpose for people and... and um, have you got any tips around doing that remotely? Because I think that, that 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 there's been not just a crisis and, and really tough to deal with, but it's dealing with and leading from a from a distance. I think has been particularly challenging. Um, yeah, I think that is that is a. I don't think anyone solved that. Um, mm. We're missing human contact, um, but the, there are good things about Zoom. Um, one thing occurred to me yesterday because we're going through a huge reorganization in the middle of the triathlon we are reorganizing our whole business to meet the needs of e-commerce because our customers uh change their habits and their shopping patterns in um they they changed what we'd planned for five years of change in five months mm -hmm. so the switch particularly in rural america from going into a store and taking things off a super center shelf and then in, and going from that to delivery or picking it up from the store or delivering to home or now in several areas we deliver into your home we will go into your home and put it in your fridge that's where that change has caused an extraordinary amount of pressure inside the inside the company i i feel um we're also because we're so fortunate. We're one. We're in one of the few industries, and a lot of people on this call will be on indus in industries that are struggling to exist. Um, the airline industry, the hospitality industry. We are needed, and so w what we're dealing with, we feel very lucky to be dealing with it. Um, and um, but at the same time, we're trying to rearrange our company and mm. go through a sort of change in mindset, which was similar to the shift from the Soviet. Yeah, the the command and control that we needed in the Cold War to the mission command of the asymmetric threats that we faced after 1990. We're going through that shift at the same time, and we're having to change all our um, all our sort of structures. Um, we had a hard week this last week. We have um, had to reorganise, which uh, which means that some teams uh, were not needed anymore, and so people were displaced. Some people I've invited to this call are in that situation. And um, we, so we are layering on top of the crisis. We're also giving ourselves harder things to do because we have to, otherwise we become irrelevant to our customer. And at the same time, uh, I, I wouldn't underestimate, it may be a little bit hard to perceive on your side of the Atlantic, but the, um, the death of George, the murder of George Floyd was a very, very significant Shift yeah, was the philosophy and culture of this country in America. Yeah, and um, so um, we, at the same time as helping leaders go through the crisis, we're also having to help leaders think about what's the implications of this enormous amount of racial inequity that we now see that we should have seen before, and what are we going to do about it? Mm. So, um, to me, um, the key behaviours that we're encouraging to get people through the crisis are listening um you know you remember the three circles um adair's three circles which mm -hmm. we were taught at sandhurst and i still use on a daily basis the team task and the individual i know that's been talked about in previous sessions this is the first situation i've ever seen where the the mission and the individual are both equally huge mm -hmm. if leaders aren't focusing on individual people in their teams and knowing how they're feeling knowing what they're dealing with knowing what it's like for a as, uh, for a, a parent and she's got um you know three children crawling all over her as she is also trying to you know excel in her job if you're not aware of that you're going to fail as a leader yeah. so that's a very very interesting set of behaviors that we're having to encourage and at the same time those are the precisely the behaviors we need for the future so this is an opportunity for people like me to say I lure them into training on crisis and my sexy counterterrorism background is part of that. And what I end up talking about is empathy, it's um, emotional intelligence, it's psychological safety, all those really good skills which are unbelievably important at the moment. 
And what I hope is that as we get through this, those remain sticky in our company going forward, because those are very, very important always, I think. And I think you guys would, would um, agree with that. Correct. And and with the leaders that I'm, uh, even just the last two days, I've been coaching leaders and those three things, empathy, emotional intelligence, and creating greater psychological safety came up time and again. Mm. And, and the leaders who are going to succeed and stay in their roles have that. And the others who are struggling, that is the major area to develop. Yeah. And with so many people from so many different countries, Ben and I were interested in the differences in leadership styles and cultures that you've experienced having lived in a multinational experience based okay from the UK, but you traveled around the world and then you've now become a US citizen. What would you find the differences in leadership styles and cultures between now you're in the heartland of the USA and other nations? What have you picked up? Um, this can I just, I, I, that's a really interesting question. Can I just finish on the uh, one piece I forgot was to talk mm. about the the impact of the George Floyd death and murder yeah. was that um, good leaders had to say to their teams, I don't know how to respond to this. I do not understand the, uh, the black and African American um, experience. And the only way we can get through this is for me to learn with you. So senior leaders saying that, again, along those, along with those other three, public learning, public um, sort of lack of ego and willingness to say, I don't know, is very, very powerful. So add that to the, the other three. I think that's really important for all leaders. And I'm trying to do the same. We, our egos usually force us into pretending to be an expert, trying to be the leader teacher. I think personally, we should be lead learners now, not leader teachers. I think we have to lead out to learn out front of our teams, not just teach, because we don't know. I don't know. I'm a, you know, I'm a uh, ultra boomer, and I'm trying to learn from the uh, the generations behind me who really understand the conditions our customers are working. In. Yeah, um, and just and just staying with that one, James. Um, yeah, learning and letting go of things that we thought we knew, unlearning. Yeah. Um, I'm finding it fascinating. I'm as someone who's dyslexic. I listen to about 80 audiobooks a year on a whole range of things. One from Shoe Dog about Phil Knight and Nike and how he started up and yeah. scraped through getting his business to where it is. But Akala and his book Natives and uh, as a sort of Jamaican English heritage. And he was talking about the view and particularly it, it came before Black Lives Matter. Uh, really hit off, but I, I just find that is an excellent book for people who are like me, ignorant. Although I've got, you know, my best man and friend was a Jamaican. I got married in Jamaica and, and yeah. that culture, but you don't. You think, you know, oh, I have a friend, and, and therefore I'm not. No, you, you've got to really, yeah. really, really learn. And it was, it's been massive here, as it has been in in, in America. That that whole that whole movement, and we've got to do something about it. Yeah, so, yeah. So, sorry, I was. I, no, I agree, well. and uh, the books I'm going to talk about are that in that direction, not leadership development. But, um, mm -hmm. so, 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 back onto differences, America yeah. versus other nations. Um, so, some of these won't surprise you. So, the difference between nations first. Um, uh, America is an entire culture built around commerce and making things happen and driving business and um the so many things whether it's the the fact that we we have made thanksgiving a commercial activity or valentine's day you buy presents for everyone and cards for everyone not just your your loved one or uh, everything is d driven by commerce that's how our sort of it's incredible um machine which is america works so it does tend to be that, like in the medical, um, the medical community, people are very, very siloed by expertise. Uh, so, if you go into a, a British hospital, you're going to be you're going to be um, treated by one exhausted, probably young doctor. In America, you will get passed from expert to expert. Someone will look at your X-ray. Someone will prescribe you the medicines. Someone will take you off for a CT scan. So it's because that is how money is made. And so uh, that plus some other sort of psychological issues and philosophical issues means that America tends to be quite siloed and businesses tend to be quite siloed. And we are as a company 
that is a real problem for us right now because people have to collaborate and come together to, to be successful in the sort of agile environment of the future. Um, so the, the biggest, that's one of the biggest differences and um, it, it, it manifests itself in the military. Um, in, in European countries, small countries, you have no choice but to collaborate. We're much better at working in teams. And a lot of Brits being like Ju Judith that you mentioned, being very, very successful in Walmart. She's one of a number of very senior figures that came from ASDA into Walmart in the US and being very successful, partly because they know how to work with few resources and collaborate really well. I, I do think that's a sort of national trait. Um, the, um, uh, the difference between um, the sort of commercial world and the military, having had a, you know, a career in both, um, I don't think I've had a, a really good evaluation since 2006 when I left the military. I don't think I've had, uh, and in the military you tend to underestimate quite how important that is. And the and that's, that is in support of a, a very objective um, talent structure, sort of how you're managed from a point of view of the moment you join the military until you leave is, is a much more objective way than, than you find in, in certainly in, in our company and I think most institutions. That objective nature of other people deciding what your career should be and you being moved around is priceless. Uh, and I envy so much the ability to take, like you and I were taken out of our roles and put into the staff college for a year plus and did nothing but learn to prepare us for the future. That is inconceivable in companies which are looking at the bottom line. So um, the, 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 and the result of those things is that in the commercial world, I believe that there is far too much emphasis put on in relationships because you haven't got an objective structure looking after your career, you tend to rely on relationships more, which is not good. It's not good for the maverick. It's not good for people pushing back on their bosses. It's not good for people being really clear about what they believe is wrong and the psychological safety we were mentioning earlier on. Uh, not every company, there's some, Procter & Gamble has a very famous sort of structure for bringing people up through the company. But when you get to our scale, it's very, very difficult to do that. And so I think some of the institutional elements that exist within the military or the or business create leaders of a different nature. And um, the there is uh, one way to be very successful in the business world is to do as you're told. Uh, in the military, it's less like that, which seems counterintuitive. Anyone listening that you know would usually imagine that military just follow orders. Actually, you're trained not to. You're trained to be institutionally insubordinate, and if you, you know, especially the British Army or the Israeli Army. Uh, and um, so, what I'm trying to do is to create a, a structure which will allow some objectivity. Use data. Use structures to move people around to give them the sort of career that will prepare them for the future not to let them go up a silo um, if we do that we will get more of the leaders we want we will get the leaders that are more likely to be entrepreneurial to, to, to take risks to make the odd mistake and not to be have their career end and um, i'm really proud how walmart is done with that uh, and uh, how how we're moving and how people accept that it's a um, it's it's val it would be valuable and necessary, but it's very hard to do because of our scale. Well, I think you know you, you talk, talk about. I love the sound of that. That that sounds like such a good way of of give, giving people like such a broad outlook of a company and such and probably moving diversity of thought around the com company as well. Yeah, I, I love that idea. And diversity in every respect. So um, mm -hmm. uh, we are very aggressive with making sure we have. Uh, we are improving the metrics on uh, on having women in senior positions and all minorities. But clearly, at the moment, we're very, very focused on Black and African American. But but all minorities are, are you know we need um, and it's it it makes business sense. If our customers come from a particular set of um, cultures and we don't, then we're not going to understand what they want. Yeah. Um, if we uh, and so there's, there's lots and lots of stories of why that's valuable when you have 
Um, and if men are making decisions about what women want, it's going to go very badly wrong. We can't <laughs> even choose their birthday present. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, like they used to say in the army, the, uh, the women's uniform was designed by men. And it's why it was, they always hated wearing the uniform yeah. because it was just so um, badly designed. I and can, I was thinking, uh, go on, sorry. I, I can probably, I was really enjoying the other day when someone asked me to name some people that should be in a program that we were putting together. And the first five names that came to my head were women. And I thought that is really good. That is really different mm -hmm. from where we were a few years ago when, um, so I, it, we're making progress. There's any, any Walmart associate that's watching this will know that we've got a long way to go, but we really, really care about it. Yeah. Well, we, we want to continue to do that. We had Izzy Fox last week on the series. She was great. Oh yeah. Venture Catalyst. And, and I think, you know, the legacy that you'll be leaving will happen during your time in Walmart, but also long after you've gone, I, I remember, He's no, no longer alive, but there was a marvelous guy, Brigadier Harry, and I can't remember his surname now, but somebody who was at McKinsey would remind me. And I, when I left the army, I went for a brief series of interviews, but being numerically challenged, I, I got to about stage six of the interview at McKinsey and I, I blew out. Um, but, but I met him and he was fascinating and, and got me to go through the process. He said, even though you're, you're way past the age limit, I think you should come through. And I just respected the way that McKinsey were doing their selection of their officers and, and or their leaders and, and putting them on. So having a process like this, bringing the best from each civil and military is good. And yeah. anything else about differences in leadership style and cultures between the military and business that you think is, is worth raising? Because both can learn from each other. Um, I think the... Obviously, my experience is mostly the British Army, but the, the British Army wastes an awful lot of time worrying about class. Uh, may have improved since I was there, um, but um, we—it's uh, extraordinary how much talent doesn't get identified and used because they didn't go to the right school, or so the sort of vestiges of a class system are very, very unhealthy. And um, and it's one of the reasons I'm so proud to be American. Uh, there are different kinds of class in America, wealth or education, but um, you can be poor and edu uneducated in England and, you know, seem to be very high class. It doesn't make any sense at all. So um, uh, I think that's uh, when I were, when I was instructor at Sandhurst uh, and I, I had a platoon and um, I had one guy who had come from the ranks, who was exceptional, absolutely exceptional. He had been a mechanic in the Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers in the Army Air Corps, would tend to have a very, very high class, high quality group. And could I get any regiment interested in him? Not at all. I also had another guy who, who uh, whose father was not a, he was a life peer. And I had so many people wanting him and he was, you know, he was good enough to get through the program, but I wouldn't have taken him. That is a problem. I don't know if it's still quite as bad as it used to be, but it's, um, it, you know, we should get over that. Um, uh, and uh, it holds it holds us back. Um, yeah, it does. I remember hearing when I was with the Scots Guards, a conversation between an adjutant and a commanding officer saying, and I won't mention their names, but so-and-so who was a Viscount and so-and-so who was a Right Honourable, were both pretty average officers, but what should we do with them? Oh, let's keep them. It's good to have aristocracy in the regiment for a couple more years, and then we'll cull them off. And I couldn't believe I was actually listening to this. So it was all that you you worried about. But um, on to military and business roles. Um, yeah. Who inspired and inspires you, and, and who would you pick out if you had a couple of people to mention by name and the qualities that they had, James? Um, uh, I really like people who have got so much capacity that they can do an incredible job and also think about people at the same time and care about people. And the 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 more sort of the lower down the people they care about, the more I like it. And I was very lucky. I was military assistant to Mike Walker. Oh right, he was and, good. Um, so he when he was commander in chief. And um, so for those unfamiliar, a, a military assistant is like executive officer to a, a general. It's a lieutenant colonel position. You essentially become a sort of extension of them. And I was very lucky to be chosen by 
now Lord Walker, I think, um, to be his MA. And it was every day was a privilege. Every day I saw some exquisite behavior by him towards ordinary people. Um, and and I remember sitting in his office. I used to sit, I used to be on every call, sitting in every, you know, every meeting with him. Often I would just sit there shaking my head thinking, how on earth could he have thought that? That's incredible. Uh, I will never be like that. Um, but the thing, we once went to Cyprus together on a visit to visit military units. And this guy had um, come all the way across the island from the Turkish side, all the way across the island uh, to see him. And this guy had been uh, a driver or a servant in the household of um, uh, Mike Walker's wife's father, who was, I think, a you know, very senior officer in Cyprus. So the young Mike Walker and Tor Walker, when they were like very, very young, before they were married, this guy had got to know them. And 20, 30 years later, he came all the way across the island to come and visit and to say hello to him because they loved him so much. And just little things like that I find extraordinary. And yeah, if inspiration is you want to repeat and to be like someone, I, I, he would do so many things like that. Can I just stay with him for a minute? It yeah. reminded me of when I was um, bad carrier agency to Peter Ringe, who was chief of general oh, staff. Oh, that's right. Mike was the assistant chief of general staff. And he, um, big man, the two of them big man, and, and Peter Ringe was, was quite a snob. And he saw Mike Walker walking down the corridor of the Ministry of Defence in CNA waterproof, very cheap waterproof, <laughs> rustling along, way out of size, you know, his arms lost down the sleeves, and his helmet of his moped. <laughs> Peter Ridge, hey, said, yes, you riding a motorbike? Uh, yes, said, yes. I hope you're not going to do that again, come in like that. You've got a staff car. No, I'll use the moped. And he just went into his office, ignored him. And I thought, yeah. brilliant, you know, because he was just, He's going to come in a moped. Why not? Yeah. Didn't need a staff car. Save the guy the drive. Brilliant. Yeah. And that was so to our previous conversation about class and snobbery, Mike Walker didn't know what those things were. He was just yeah. a genius. Um, other, other, uh, um, I was very inspired by this, by um, the behaviors of um, Rob Fry. So Rob Fry, who was, um, I worked for when I was in that counterterrorism role. Between he, him and me was a, a wonderful guy called James Bucknell, who I absolutely love, who he basically gave me top cover and freedom to, to do what I needed to do around the world with other agencies, MI6, et cetera. And James Bucknell was just a joy to work for because he trusted people. Uh, and then above him was Rob Fry, who allowed James to be like that. So this sort of um, I've always wanted to be the kind of leader that would help other people get stuff done. And I th and the the, um, the there's a guy called um, Snook um, who was uh, he's a colonel, U.S. Army colonel. He he wrote the um, uh, he wrote the 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 curriculum for leadership. We rewrote it at West Point and turned it into something very good. Um, is the, the whole structure of be, know, and do, what you should be, what you should know, and what you should do. And he's now a professor at Harvard. And his definition of leadership is that a leader should create the conditions for a team to succeed and remove obstacles, uh, which I've really loved as a, I've found that very inspiring because that is, it puts it, it's all about the team, it's not about the leader. The leader's job is to make them successful. And you can put any kind, anything fits into that definition, whether it's coaching people or holding them accountable or driving them hard or inspiring, everything fits into that. But it's about making them, you know, giving them the tools to succeed. Uh, and Rob Fry and James Bucknell really did that with me. And um, and I remember once going into history, Rob Fry ended up, as I was telling you earlier, he was the chairman of one of the companies that I went to join. And I ended up an American citizen because of his encouragement to go to control risks and then et cetera. But um, he, um, uh, Rob Fry, basically encouraged me to do things when I was really, really sort of 
frustrated by the civil service. Uh, I wanted to do that. Um, a guy I won't name from Vauxhall Cross in, in MI6 and I had hatched this plot and we wanted to do it and I was getting no support, no encouragement and in fact lots of obstacles were putting in my way and Rob Fry, I went into his office, I admit I was nearly tearful with anger, I was so, so frustrated and he said, calm down, um, uh, if it's a good idea, do it. If it's not a good idea, it's going to fail and you'll probably fail with it. But if it's a really good idea, just get on with it and I'll back you up. And so I did it and it became this sort of global worldwide operation, which was really and it's still going. I, 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 was, I, I spotted something the other day which suggested that the team, this global joint counterterrorism training advisory team is still working all over the world. And um, that was that was a great moment. I left his office. I stopped crying, <laughs> left his office. And just like I was so bolstered by his support that I went and did something, uh, which was um, one of the things, you know, one of the questions you're going to ask me later. I'm very proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's fantastic. And from the things that did work and obviously things didn't work as well. So what what about a story of when you did get it wrong and what you learned from it, James, and how it shaped you as a leader today? Those are the easiest things to ones to think of. I made a lot of mistakes. Um, in I often think I wish I could go and be commanding officer of my battalion now, with what I now know. I, I really wish some of those skills that we were just discussing, empathy, and um, particularly the I should have made more of an effort to get the ideas out of the team instead of being you know very self-satisfied and arrogant saying this is what we're going to do here's the plan it's going to be a great plan sometimes it was other times it wasn't and um the i think i would i would lead differently i think i'd be more patient i think i would put a lot more effort into i i i, I would, if you read through all your confidential reports or your evaluations you see a pattern the pattern for me was like being impatient with people i deemed less capable than myself which was a phrase that was like as a second lieutenant then it kept popping up so i think that that was something i should have i would like to go and fix but um we all get a second chance and so i'm trying to not be that person in walmart which is now that i understand but um um the the mistake i think one of the biggest mistakes i made was i was for the first four years working with walmart i was working for mckinney rogers um uh, and they were a consultancy that was working with Walmart. And I had four years essentially running a team that was creating the staff college and RCDS and all those things that, you know, that, that we were discussing. And then um, uh, Bill Simon, the CEO, said, this is super expensive having a team of consultants. Um, I'd like to bring you in in-house. So basically made an offer and bought the team and I then was I then became an officer in Walmart, and um, this is 2012. And so I crossed from senior partner into being a uh, an officer in the company. And uh, I had I didn't put nearly enough effort into thinking about the implications of that. In that transition, I thought um, everyone likes me. They know I've done a great job. I have a lot of credibility. I just carry on being who I am and I had had some feedback that like you're more Walmart than Walmart so I believed that which wasn't true and um and I had a very rocky few months uh where I I discovered that um the reality was that uh I hadn't um the, the person I went to work for thought I was there to replace him so I had a terrible relationship with him and I didn't really, I, I had no empathy for his situation. So I didn't realize that. So essentially that transition was very, very badly handled. And I've, I've probably given more advice about that to other people than any success I've ever had, because it's a really important thing. What is, what is going on? It's like back to the triathlon. Where are we right now? How am I leading? Am I, who am I? Am I doing a good job? Who's going to tell me? How do I find that out? How do I respond to that? Do I reflect enough? So it, that that was a bad deal, and I hope I've improved as a result. Thank you for that. 
And, and on a lighter note, before we go dark again, what about uh, some amusing stories about leadership from your time in Walmart and your time in the military? Maybe a story in each. Um, uh, I, this is the hardest one. I noticed this Shaw really struggled because I don't think he gave you an answer. But um, uh, I was thinking of, uh, I was looking around in here for inspiration just now. Then I saw I had this, so um, this hat. So um, uh, do you get, are you familiar with the, uh, um, the Tiger King? Joe Exotic, etc. Have you seen that? Is that me? I, ha I haven't, but maybe Ben has. He's got some anyone in America know about that. So yeah, it's, sort of thing. it's it's made yeah, it over here. Yeah. It got us through the first few weeks of COVID. But um, so when I was commanding officer in uh, of one PWRR, uh, my final trip, my final period with the battalion was in Batas, uh, in so armored training in Canada. Uh, which I didn't do very well, to be honest. I was saved by the guy who actually gave me this hat. So um, the, we had a sort of farewell before I went off to be a colonel in the MOD and do that counterterrorism role. We had a farewell, and uh, this is what they presented me with, which is the, the the nickname of the regiment is the Tigers. We had a tiger on our arm for 22 years in 21 years in in India, and uh, so James Coote and a bunch were down in medicine hat i think they bought this from a woman of ill repute uh stuck a cat badge on it and gave it to me and i so i think i i feel i i can't have been so bad as the ceo that they didn't at least think i could take something like that and it's one of my proudest mementos of my time in the army but um yeah yeah so um Anyway, move on. That's good. That's good. Now, will we? I'll do one question, then I'll hand over to Ben because Ben's going to get some questions. We're going to start some some questions. What about uh, a darkest moment in your career or your life, and, and what you learned from it, James? Um, it was a career moment. It's a very easy to answer this one because I give this advice on a daily basis, particularly at the moment. So, um, uh, I don't have a traditional background that you would expect for someone who runs has a job like mine. Normally, it would be a PhD in IO psychology or deep experience in sort of learning and, um, and an education of that. I don't have any of those things. And uh, a, a guy was hired into the company from outside to be my boss as a senior vice president. And he had all of those things. And he took one look at me. And for the first time in my, time in my life, I had a boss that thought I shouldn't have the job that I had. In fact, instantly he saw that and decided and um that was extremely difficult because he he essentially said um i don't anything you're doing is worthless and you as a person shouldn't be in this role and i'm gonna make sure that i deal with that so whether it was real or not it felt to me like i was about to be fired and that was a after you know a pretty good trajectory all the way through my military career and then into um control risks and mckinney rogers and into the company and hired as a vice president which is very unusual um suddenly it went off a cliff like and uh what i realized i didn't realize how badly it was affecting me uh but it did and the um i didn't talk to enough people about it and i tend to process things publicly so every program i run tends to be a little bit of a like a a sort of psychiatrist couch for me i find it very helpful to talk about stuff to large groups of people and that actually you know the final lesson i'll talk about is that why that's valuable but um so someone in one, another part of the business after listening to me she took me aside and she said um you should know that adversity introduces you to yourself and um that was the most important advice anyone's ever given me and on my deathbed, I will say that is the most important thing I was ever told because it really sort of set me back. And I thought, if that's true, who am I meeting? Uh, do I like that person? Is this going to help me going forward, with seeing that person? And it made me think, no, I, I've, got, I've got to come out of this in a way which is going to help me move forward. And it really, really, really helped. And I just decided to be different. I took accountability for it. I decided, keep this guy's wrong. If I'm anything, then I can prove that. And it sort of 
started me in a sort of virtual spiral back up again. And I've I've used that phrase a thousands of times. And um, I think I don't know whether, you to yourself. Yeah, I yeah it. it's really important. And I don't know, you know, that guy got fired about two months later because everyone thought he was an idiot. And I hadn't even bothered asking. Um, I was just like on this downward track. So really important. James, that's really brilliant. Now, you are so uh, interesting. You've got so much to talk about. We've only got 15 minutes left. So I'd like to hand over to Ben to take the questions. We won't probably do the mm. healthy, wealthy and wise this time. Yeah, if Ben, you just if you just um, host the questions because we've got some great people and a lot of people on here. But James, this is fabulous so far, so keep it going. And let's let's do yeah, some quick thanks thanks so much. question and answers. Yeah, thanks, James. We've got loads of comments, loads of questions. Uh, a lot of people enjoying your triathlon metaphor um, and uh, and and your lead learning lead lead learners. Um, uh, they're really enjoying some of the things you've, you've already said. And um, we've got some questions coming through. Firstly, from um, Rob uh, Turl. So yeah. we'll bring it up on the screen. So what difference do you see in communication skills between the military and Walmart? Interesting. Between the military and Walmart. I think um, the uh, Walmart is better at storytelling. Uh, we, we're blessed with an incredible CEO, called Doug McMillan, who is a yeah. natural storyteller. Uh, and the way people communicate is stories with emotion attached. Uh, I don't think the military is good as good at that. I think we tend to be very sort of um, masculine and sort of deliberate. And we've created a culture where we think you just explain and that's enough. Metaphors and stories are really, really important. So I would, I would give that one to Walmart. I think we're better at that kind of communication, particularly in times of trouble. Humans spend all their time trying to make sense of things. That's what we do. We're sense makers. Yeah. Metaphors and stories help you make sense of the world. So um, I think I would give that one to Walmart. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. We've got another question from um, Priscilla. Um, so James is so genuine of a leader. I've worked with James and his leadership style would make Mr. Sam proud. Absolutely brilliant. Just a lovely uh, comment from Priscilla there. And uh, two He's questions from well. Tracy. <laughs> Tracy Williams. <laughs> Two questions. What is the biggest mistake you see leaders make and what is a must-read leadership book you'd recommend? Oh, um, the second part of that is really difficult for me. I never, I never read leadership books. Um, uh, I just read books. Um, if, if there is a book on a leadership book, I would, that, and no one's going to want to read this, it's, uh, it's written by a guy called by Count Slim, it's called Defeat into Victory. I learned so much about from him about leadership, but I'll catch up with Tracy and give her a praise of that in the future. Uh, biggest mistake you see leaders make? Um, uh, I think it's um, it comes back to some of the advice I was going to give. the The biggest mistake I I see is leaders that. They, they, they don't believe their team or, or a person can do something. And because of that, that person then behaves in the way that you expect. It's the self-fulfilling prophecy. So I see really good people that I've worked with and I really admire struggling with a leader who doesn't think that they can do anything. And sure enough, they can't. So reversing that as a leader is a really good thing. How do you believe in someone? Because if you believe in them, they will give you what you believe. Uh, a very senior, um, actually Deanna Baker, who Tracy will know, she's a senior vice president in Walmart. She said, I can do anything my boss thinks I can do. And that really is a beautiful way of saying the self-fulfilling prophecy is a real thing. She said, and it, I believe I can do anything my boss thinks I can do. That's great. Yeah. That's sort of come through in a lot of the interviews we've, we've, we've had also sort of just sort of trusting and delegating to people yeah, just build that, builds that um, skill set as well. That that, that people yeah. uh, get more confidence, but they also build the ability to 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 actually perform um, at different levels. Absolutely, great question. Thanks, Tracy. And um, one from Keith. Um, how would James describe the difference between leadership and management? What challenges has he seen in helping his management team to differentiate between the two? Um. So I think uh, there's, there's bound to be all kinds of 
um, very simple ways of answering that. I, I, it, management is essentially the skills and competencies to get something done. So a manager is able to organize people and is able to set goals and it is the process. So you need really good managers. Um, and But the leadership side, for me, is the inspiration and the, the sort of encouragement and imparting the belief that you can do really difficult things on the management side. So um, you need both though. Um, there's very rare that you will find that there's no leader in Walmart that can't manage. There's a hundred percent guaranteed certainty. If you can't execute at scale in Walmart, you're not going to go very far. Um, we do promote too many managers. The, the thing that's more likely to be missing is an understanding of the value attached to the management skills of the inspiration and the guidance and the sort of encouragement and the belief, which is usually really good leaders can do. Uh, I hope that that's a bit of a messy answer. But, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Thanks, Keith. Um, and uh, Tracy ju just wanted to comment around, around the adversity introduces you to yourself. I think that sounds really well. Um, and a, a good question from um, Antoinette Nash. What advice would you give a leader who wants to rebrand themselves? Oh. Uh, firstly, is like, why do you want to do that? So you should ask yourself that question. Um, if the answer to it is that... Um, uh, is is yes, and it's not just you that says that. You you've asked other people like internet. You better ask me before you do anything serious in this regard because your brand is incredible. But uh, so, firstly, examine your motivations. Secondly, make sure it's authentic um, because a brand which isn't consistent doesn't mean anything at all. Um, the third thing is. The, a brand is other people's view of you, not yours. So how on earth do you know how to make that happen? Um, my, my advice would always be be authentic, be yourself, be the best sort of leader you possibly can and the brand will follow. Don't make any sort of radical decisions about being something totally different. Antoinette mm -hmm. is extremely smart. She won't, she's just giving me difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she has a friend who has a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And another question from Rob. Uh, the military promotes leaders from within. How do you get that mix between internal promotion and new blood recruitment from leaders at Walmart? Um, yeah, the military does. The pipeline in the military is a very, very strong thing. And it's enabled by the fact you take people out at a relatively young age at the top. You have to have that. Otherwise, there's blockers all the way. So military pipeline is, uh, is, is very strong. I would say that there are external injections of talent you could bring in even in the military, but that's very countercultural. Um, and um, and it's, uh, so I, you know, I will stay, stay away from that discussion, but I, would, I do think it would be valuable. Mm. How we do it in Walmart is that um, we, um, the proportion is roughly sort of 70, 30, that mo you know, just about everyone up to a certain level is internal, but we have people join at multiple levels. Uh, and it's usually around 70% are internal, 30% are external. Uh, we need the extra blood. Um, what I'm trying to do, going back to the conversation early on, is to give people a, such a variety of career moves that you create your external talent inside. So they've been to South Africa to turn around the South Africa business. They've been to China to see what massive growth is like. They've been to Flipkart in India, where they've seen how they're competing with Amazon and winning. They So if you give that kind of career to people, you don't need to worry about external. And that's what the military do so well. You know, my career was incredibly varied. Um, so, um, uh, but it's a never ending discussion. And um, I'm more interested in how do we how do we make sure that we are giving diversity a chance? And if we can't haven't got enough diversity, we will have to bring that up from outside because you can't invent diversity at a particular level. Yeah, very true. We're coming towards the end, Ben. Do you want just last a couple of questions, and then uh, maybe James would end with the uh, with the book and also the last couple of top tips that he could leave us with. 
Yep. So um, we've uh, we've exhausted questions on the feed there. So some really nice comments and questions. Thanks everyone. That's been been lovely to have people people join in. Um, so we always uh, ask our um, interviewees um, uh, a couple of sort of questions at the end, just to sort of see uh, uh, an interesting book which they're, they're they're either currently reading or, or one that's been very important to them in in their development or life. Um. I could probably need to choose, choose from there. <laughs> um, so um, the these aren't leadership books, but these are about the world, which is you know tangentially um, a uh, you know important to leadership. So this is this is a book called The Invention of Nature. Uh, can you read that? And it's yeah, written yeah. about a. a, a someone that no one's really heard of anymore called Alexander von Humboldt, who essentially under, first one to understand and created the idea of an ecosystem. And he was an incredibly influential person. There are more natural phenomena, road, um, lakes, the Humboldt current, the Humboldt squid. Um, there are more natural phenomena named after him than any other ever person that's ever lived. He inspired Darwin, he inspired um, so many of the sort of the most prominent global naturalists and it's a wonderful book when you, you, you sort of you get immersed in the in an incredible intellect which is him and it's beautifully written by Andrea Wolf so um, I would strongly recommend that um, another book which has affected me a lot recently and, and I would give you a different book next week if you ask me the question but um, because of the Black Lives Matter movement the way i react to it i've been through uh, the, the racial equity institute which is two days of training but the thing that really resonates with me as i was talking about the stories and so anything by james baldwin particularly if beale street could talk because he takes you into what it's like being black in the 1960s in america and the appalling crushing um sort of unfairness of the of the legal system which is what's described in this book um so uh, the may not resonate with anyone else but that's what is you know has made those things have affected me most recently and um uh, and i do think that we you know I'm, I'm trying to get leaders in walmart to open up and expand their thinking so i very rarely would say read malcolm gladwell or read servant leadership I mean, people do that anyway I, so i'm always recommending you do something a little bit more expansive take yourself out of your comfort zone learn something and then discuss it and you'll find your your head expanding as you do it is what i try and do anyway fantastic james james Love it's it. been a real real honor having you on the series um i thought you'd be uh, bring a variety and challenge and some new thoughts and some new ideas and that lovely mix of the military and the different experiences you've had in business and particularly in a phenomenal organization like walmart thank you and what would you leave with us as, as a final top tip before you uh, you say goodbye to people and uh, we sign off uh, just one um i used the self-fulfilling prophecy so i leadership is a social activity there's an organization the center for creative leadership in america actually they describe this leadership is a social activity in other words it's what you do with your team and anything you think you're achieving because you've told people to do it or you inspired it to do it people to do it they've decided to do it so it's a that to me is a very very different way of looking at leadership um, and it's in line with the what the snoop thing about you know creating conditions for your team to succeed treat it as a social activity see it as a society know you have to win people over and continue with that and you'll probably be more successful as a leader and I don't do any of these things very well, by the way. I am not the, the sort of um, the, the archetypal example you should use, but I do know what I got wrong. James, thank you. Humility to the end. Lovely having you on the series. And guys, thank you, everybody who's listened in. And join us next week um, talking about um, a bit of difference. We have Lucy Giles, Colonel Lucy Giles, the president of the Army Officer Selection Board. Very interesting insights Lucy has had. Um, breaking glass ceilings throughout the army. And then Kath Pasami, the CEO at Capita of the recruiting group. And these are two recommendations from uh, the, common, the former commandant of Santos, Paul Nansen. And uh, 
James, we look forward to your two recommendations and getting them both in the series. Thank you, James, for having me. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, James. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.